Welcome, welcome everyone to come to our, our webinar today. Uh, we actually do a lot of webinars on different topics related to safety and uh, we welcome all the questions and all uh, the discussions so we can share and make the industry better and safer. Uh, but before I start, please be reminded that uh, you please mute your mic and if you have any questions, please ask them in the question or the chat tab. Uh, I will try my best to answer them during the, pod, uh, during the webinar. Um, however, if I can't really answer them all during the webinar, I will try to answer them afterwards through emails. And uh, I do have a lot of information to share today, so possibly I can only answer one or two questions at most. So let's get started. So today we'll talk about management of change, not just man management of change, but also management of change for alarm system, for the alarm rationalization specifically. We all know that management of change is a very crucial activity that's being recognized by OSHA's PSM, the Process Safety Management Regulation. And it is actually also a stage within the ISA 18.2, the alarm management standard. Today we will explore how exactly is an MOC being conducted according to the PSM and also according to the standard. We will have a little comparison between them. We will look at different situations where um, MOC is done improperly. So within this alarm system specifically, and then resulted in very, very catastrophic result and consequences. And finally, we will look at how our SUS alarm, our software can help you to go through this management of change for your alarm system, how our software is suitable and how efficiently it can be done through our software. Before I go into the topic, a little bit about myself. I'm Paul Chen, and I've been in functional safety for more than five years now. Originally, I'm from the Exodus Asia Pacific office, which is in Singapore, but I was transferred to the US headquarter last year. I didn't actually start out as an engineer. In fact, I was a biochemist, but after getting into Exeter, I was heavily involved in process safety projects like HAZOP or SEAL selections, and I did my first PHA, PHA and LOPA workshop when I was in South Korea for three months. And uh, afterwards, I also get involved in other, other things like SEAL calculations, SEAL verifications for the SIFs, for their architectures and also review their designs. And also, after coming to the US, I have been facilitating a lot of the alarm management workshops. So enough about me, a little bit about uh, Exeter then. Exeter was founded in 1999 by a group of experts all over the world. As you can see, it is all scattered, all these little uh, orange, yellow pyramids scattered around the world. That means that we have people there within that region from a, from the far east to the far west. And uh, we provide guidance related to the automation, related to functional safety, alarm management, and cybersecurity. And we provide our guidance and we focus on the customers by three main areas. First of all, we have our very useful and very efficient tools for our customer. We have SIL Excellentia, uh, which uh, the most famous module would be the silver module, and that is for SIL verification. And we are very proud to say that it's just the most accurate tool to calculate the PFD or PFH, the probability of failure, for SIF because we're using Markov modeling within that software. And we also have SEAL Alarm. SEAL Alarm is a 
very useful tool that can help the alarm rationalization process. And the alarm rationalization process isn't just the process for the rationalization, but it is, as we can see later, that it is a life cycle that covers everything, how you handle the whole alarm system throughout the whole plant life. And Seal Alarm can help you through that very efficiently for the whole life cycle. Other than our tools, we also provide certifications. We provide certifications for devices. We, we give serrated uh, devices certifications, and we also provide cybersecurity certifications for devices. And other than these devices like actuators and valve bodies or uh, rose mount uh, sensor, we also provide certifications for personnel. For example, the CFSP and also the CFSE, so that people can show their competency to, in order to work in the functional safety world, in order to work in the safety field. Other than certifications, we also have a group of expertise, ex experts to provide different expertise in different areas. Me, myself, I am very active in process safety and alarm rationalization. And I'm also taking part in the cybersecurity assessment as well. And we have all different uh, engineers who also do a lot of calculations and the FAMIDA for, for your devices, for manufacturers, so that they can come up with realistic failure rate in order to be used as an input data into the seal verification calculations. So we are an all-rounded company and very customer-focused company. So moving on, let's go back to our focus today about alarm, alarm system, about alarm rationalization. So what are actually the main purposes of having an effective alarm management system? First, it can ensure that your operation is safe. We all know that uh, whenever an alarm is triggered, that means that something has gone wrong. Something, something has gone into the norm, abnormal side in a way that the operator has actually need to, is needed to do something in order to bring the operation back into the safe operation range. If nothing is done, then something bad can go wrong. And that also brings us to the second point, to prevent um, plants shutdown, damage to equipment, and also process safety incidents. I know that a lot of the control system out there are set up like this. After the alarm, if the operator does not do anything, then the safety system might kick in in a way that, for example, there would be a safety trip of the whole compressor and, uh, and in a way that would result in an unplanned shutdown. So the whole process would be shut down in an unplanned way that would affect your production or might even affect your product quality in a way. And also the, an effective alarm management system can help the operator to perform their role. An effective alarm management system should have some kind of document for the operator to tell them the procedures and what to do for each of the alarm, what kind of action they have to take, what kind of course is for that, kind, for that particular alarm, and what kind of consequence if the operator does not do anything would occur afterwards. So that can be a guideline to the operator about how they can actually handle the alarm. And also, a strong and effective alarm system can also ensure that you are compliant with the standards and also the regulations. So in a, so in a sense that when unfortunately something bad happened, you can show that you are compliant with the standard you abide, abide by the regulations. And again, as I've mentioned, it can 
also help you to make a quality product if you have an effective alarm system. This is especially true if it is a batch process. A batch process might, for example, be a production of certain uh, certain medicines, so certain like penicillins. Uh, I know that for penicillins, you I don't know in details, but uh, you have different kind of stages for them. Uh, for stage one, maybe you have to increase the temperature up to a certain level. And for stage two, you actually need to cool down the whole culture to a certain level. And for the next stage, you might actually need to increase the pressure in order to kill the bacteria that is producing the penicillin. So alarm can actually be a way to indicate to the operator to tell them when to proceed on to the next stage, when to proceed on to the next phase. And if the operator does not do anything, or if the operator doesn't actually do anything that's correct, then the quality of the product might be off spec. So that's why you an, an effective alarm management system can help to make a quality product. Now, let us review the purpose of an alarm. Let us think of the whole process can be divided into three main different situations. The first one would be the normal, normal range. The second one would be the abnormal range. And the third one would be the shutdown range. And how, what actually define the binaries between these would be the PV. PV is the process variable. They are, for example, temperature. Within a certain range of temperature, then that is the normal operation range for your process. If the temperature goes up into the abnormal range, then that means that something is about to happen. But still, it's not going to bring about the consequence yet. And that is usually when the alarm set point is set at, when the alarm might come in, so that the operator can be aware of the abnormal situation. And it will help the operator to diagnose what actually what the offset is. For example, here that before the PV, if it's temperature, that means that, uh, for example, some something upstream might gone might have gone wrong, or the cooling water system has gone has gone wrong. So maybe some kind of valve to cooling water pipe might be shut, so that the operator has to do something to deal with that situation and to guide them. And this alarm can guide them to make an appropriate response in order to prevent the consequence so that they just open up the valve that's shut to the cooling water system. And if they react correctly, that means that the temperature will gradually go down back into the normal operating range. The PV will gradually go down back into a kind of an equilibrium state into, into back into its normal operating range. However, if something wrong, gone wrong, if the operator response wasn't correct, or the operator didn't do anything, then something might, bad might be happening. The next thing happened can be the safety trip. And I actually have been to uh, plants that they don't have a safety system. So in that case, the consequence would be something really bad, like loss of containment, a toxic release, or a, a rupture of the vessel in a way that there might be explosions, fire, and something really bad going wrong. So that's why each alarm is important. And if there's no response, or the response is ineffective, then something bad, the consequence will come in place. So let us see how the standard define an alarm then. The standard defined the alarm as an audible or visual means of indicating something to the operator that there is an equipment malfunction or there's some kind of a process deviation or other kind of abnormal condition 
that actually require a timely response from the operator. That the, op that the operator has to do something in time in order to prevent the consequence. This is the uh, definition that's given by the ISA standard. So you can see there are three folds, three layers of meaning of for an alarm. The first one would be it is an audible and or visual means that's indicating something to the operator that there is an abnormal situation happening right now and then it requires a timely response from the operator. And because of this, in that sense, a lot of the alarms that we thought were alarms are not actually alarms. For example, during startup, you're filling up uh, a vessel and there is a low level alarm on the vessel. But be before the level of that vessel is actually going past that set point of the low level alarm, the low level alarm is constantly being triggered. Then. So in that case, because it's a startup and also is expected, in that case, it would be an expected situation and there's nothing the operator actually needs to do. There's nothing he or she needs to do. So in that case, then it should actually be a message right there instead of an alarm. This table is a very useful tool to guide you to see whether an alarm is actually an alarm or it should be something like an alert or prompt or message or a notification that's to the operator, not something that they should respond in a timely fashion, not something they should actually take an action, for example, or there's something that's actually expected for them. So let us, now let us see how everything begins, how these kind of guidelines, this kind of philosophy behind uh, alarm rationalization comes by. It actually started in Europe. So the EEMUA standard is actually the European standard, and it is actually a kind of a guideline. Uh, it launched the discipline, the whole discipline of alarm management, because mainly because of the Milford Haven explosion. And it is a collection of different good engineering practices that is called out by the UK HSE, which is a similar authority kind of a organization as the OSHA organization in the US. And then we have the ISA standard and also the IEC standard. The ISA standard is a more Americanized version of the standard and the IEC standard is more of an international adoption of the ISA standard. In fact, there are people, ISA people actually in the IEC board that help to write the IEC standard. And they are both a uh, true audit, auditable standard, and they also have requirements and recommendations, you know, the very famous face of should and shall. If it's should, then it is a recommendation. If it is shall, then it is a requirement. And also they create a lot of common terminologies for the alarm system in the industry. That is uh, auditable to the industry in the way that the industry can understand what kind of kind of terminology that they can use. There's a standard, standardization of how to call things and how to do things. That is the point of a standard. And also they have a alarm management life cycle. I can put a, a, a kind of comparison to the functional safety life cycle. You know that the functional safety life cycle in IEC 61511 specifically uh, for the process industry is a life cycle that describes everything from the way when you even before building the plant to plan to start building the plant up to the end when you try to de decommission the plant. So that is a life cycle about safety for the whole lifetime of the plant. And the alarm management life cycle is similar. It is a life cycle for the whole lifetime of your alarm system. We will go into details later. I will show you the life cycle 
in details later. And, and what you actually need to do in each stage of the life cycle. Let us right now look at how everything is being run right now. I, I believe that two weeks ago, I went to a plant where they told me they have about 2,000 alarms every day. This is not actually something that's uncommon in the industry. When I was uh, teaching the alarm rationalization course back in Singapore about two years ago, uh, there was a, a plant in Indonesia that they told me they have more than 2,500 alarms every day. And as you can see, these are the data that we have for uh, how many alarms that they can have for every day uh, for different industries, for the oil and gas, for the petrochemical, for the power, and also other kind of industries. And it is definitely more, see, more, more of a problem in the power industry. And uh, other than the overloading of the alarm, we also have problems for alarm flood. Alarm flood would be uh, describing the situation within, for example, like within 10 minutes or within a short period of time, there are some kind of cascades of alarm, a lot of alarm coming in within a very short period of time. As you can see in the power industry that you have 350 alarm within 10 minutes. Do you think there's anyone that can actually handle 350 alarms within that short period? period of time. I mean, it's, it's just going to clock the whole screen. Even the whole code screen of the uh, control system can't show 350 alarms at the same time. That's not, that's not possible to actually diagnose the situation and bring about an effective operator action on that. That's why, according to the standards, we should actually contain the number to less than 10. And also, if possible, we have to contain most of the alarms per day to, max, to a maximum of 300 alarms per day. And other than this problem, there's also, there's also a very, very serious problem with the distribution of priorities of these alarms. Um, we know that the priorities of alarms is actually, uh, are actually built in within the control systems. Uh, let me give you an example for the Delta V system in, for Amazon control system. They usually they have the uh, critical and warning. And last week I was in a plant that they only have critical alarms and also warning uh, alarms. Critical would be the topest priority, the high priority. The warning would be the medium priority, and they didn't even have any um, advisory priority which is the low priority of alarms. And what's more horrifying was that they, they, for them, 80% of their alarms were critical. Only 20% of the alarms were warning. So 80% of them were at a high priority and 20% were at the medium priority. So imagine if there's an alarm flood situation and you have 350 alarms. So that means that at least there should be about a 300 alarms that are critical. And when we talk about priorities, there is a sense of which to deal with first, right? And you have 300 alarms that are at the highest priority. So which of them should you deal with first? That, that means that there's no such of a, the priority level, actually, this meaning of the priority level is defeated right now. In fact, as proposed by the standard, the priority distribution of all the alarms within the system should be in a form of a pyramid, with the lowest priority taking up most of the percentage of the alarm, ideally 80%, and the medium, uh, medium priority take up only the middle part of the pyramid with the highest priority taken up only the tip of the priority, uh, of the tip of the pyramid, that it is the lowest and smallest in terms of the number for the total number of alarms within your control system.
So as you can see, uh, as I have implied that these kind of, uh, if, if you have a poor alarm management system, a poor alarm system that will induce the operator stress, how can you deal with 350 alarms within 10 minutes? And also they can miss these alarms and that will result in shutdown on qualities or even something worse. Let me give you an example right here, the deep water horizon. I would imagine everyone work in this industry would be very familiar with this case. We even have a movie on this. And this is a very, very sad disaster. There's two main parts to the disaster. I'll briefly go through it, very briefly, because I expect everyone would know much about it. So there is first a blowout, and then secondly, the destruction of the whole horizon. There were 11 people killed, and dozens were injured in that incident. And now let us see what went wrong specifically in the alarm system. Originally, well, they have alarms. They, they, their alarm system didn't actually went, went down. They have these kind of alarms right there. They have sensors placed all over the horizon site. And the intention for that was whenever a sensor detect any kind of gas or fire, then an alarm has to be created on the bridge, at the drill shack, and also at the engine control room, engineering control room. And it would automatically trigger the general master alarm. And the intent of that general master alarm is to, is to tell everyone to evacuate, to go to a safe place. But the actual implementation by the site was actually they silenced all the audible and visual annunciations so that they could sleep well at night they don't want to want people to wake up at three o'clock in the morning due to these false alarms and what's worse is that they disabled the general master alarm in a way that right now you can only to activate it manually by the bridge operator. As you can see there, I, there's a lot of problems already right here. But let us go into the life cycle of the ISA alarm uh, management life cycle first and look at each part and see how this life cycle can help with preventing something like that happening. So everything has a start point. And for the life cycle for alarm management, it starts with the philosophy document. The philosophy can be, can be perceived as a kind of a guideline, as a kind of blueprint for, for you, for the whole alarm system, how you want to plan your alarm system, how you want to plan for your rationalization process, how do you want to define the alarm, how do you want to define different classifications of the alarms. And after the philosophy document is formulated, we go on to the identifications of these alarm. If it's a download from the a control system, like a Delta V control system, then you just download every alarm that's associated with all the function blocks within the control system. And that is a way to identify all the potential alarms because they are within and they are configured within your control systems. And then we will go into rationalization. Rationalization is to look at each alarm, every little alarm, every single one of them, every single alarm to see whether they are necessary, to look at their priority, to look at their causes, consequences, their operator actions, and then to see whether they're actually needed. If they, don't, they are not needed, if they are not valid, then we kick them out. If they are valid, we have to document everything so that we can have a master alarm database in a way that to keep track of everything that's happening, in a way to keep track of the authorized alarm configuration that should be static all the time. 
And after the rationalization, we go on to other detailed designs like the HMI design, the human machine interface designs. That would be, um, for example, like how the control system is showing the alarm to the operators. And also we can go into advanced alarming techniques or designs that would be something like a logical, putting like a programming into the alarms. For example, if you know that there's this alarm that would come in with other alarms and that alarm is the root cause for other alarms as well. You can silence all the other alarms, but only enunciate that and trigger that alarm and show that alarm only to the operator. And after you go through these detailed design, you go into the implementation. So you upload back into the Delta V system or your control system, and then you go into the operation and maintenance and monitor it to see whether there's something wrong with the system. You can compare KPI, the key performance indexes, like the data that I've quoted, how many alarms do you see per day? and uh, how many alarms you see per 10 minutes. If you see something wrong, if you still see like a thousand alarm every day, then you can propose for a management of change. You review to see if there's a change, if there's need to it for a change, and if there's a need, you go back into the identification, rationalization, and detailed design implementation. This, as you can see, this is a loop over there. And it is a, actually a positive loop in a way that the more you loop in and loop back, the better your alarm system is going to be. Because presumably you will catch more, catch most of the alarm, most of the problem at the first stage, for the first time, and then less of the problem as a second time, until that, until in a way that you have finally not in a way that perfect the whole system, but try to perfect the whole system to reduce most of the problems and most of the errors. And today, we will be focusing specifically on the management of change process. Let us right now jump into the management of change in the OSHA PSM contest. This diagram is from the guidelines for risk-based process industry. This is a book um, that is written by CCPS, which is the Center for Chemical Process and Safeties. And it is recognized as the best engineering practice that is required by the OSHA. And therefore, as you can see that if you don't really follow it, you can potentially held accountable for it if you don't really follow it. And if we look at it closely, the management of change is one of a pillar under the risk management. Why, why is it under the risk management? Mainly because whenever you have a management of change, you have to do a hazard review. We look into it de in detail right now. So whenever you have a management of change, you have to see and review if there is actually a need for the change. If you realize that there is a need, then you put in a request for change form, the RFC form, and pass that into the classification review. The main intent of the classification review is to classify the problem, to classify the change, in order to assemble the right team, the right multidisciplinary team for the hazard review. For example, if the change is to bypass a vessel, a reactor, for example, a reactor, then that is a change in the whole process. So when we are dealing with the hazard review, we have to have a process engineer within the team in order to address the problem. If you don't have an, a process engineer there for the hazard review, then that hazard review is invalid, it's useless, it's basically gibberish because you don't have the right people to look at a problem. So 
After you have assembled the right team, you go into hazard review and you see if there are any kind of app action items actually needed before you can implement it. So, and then you list out those action items and then pass that back to close out these action items. And then you go back into the classification review to see after closing out these action items, will that actually introduce new changes in the way that might introduce new changes and new hazard to your system? So you go on with this process again and again, up to the point you have closed out all the actions item, you can't have identify more hazard from it, and you have all the ways that is good and everything is prepared to for the implementation then you can go on to the authorization of the change. The authorization of the change is to authorize it to reveal if all the actions have been closed out, if the hazard review has been done properly, if the classification review has been done properly as well. So after everything has been checked, then you can finally implement that. And the implementation is actually outside of the MOC scope. And this is the flow as suggested by the CCPS, by the OSHA. So now let us look into a little bit more details of what question we need to ask during the reviews. For classification review, we first have to ask, is it a change? What kind of change is it? In what, in what is it is the change actually is? Is it a change in procedure? Is it a change in PNIDs? Is it a change in the equipment? For example, the piping materials. If you change the piping materials, would that change the uh, safety operating limit for the process? If that's the case, you need someone in the reliability engineering department for your hazard review and you have to ask if uh, is it actually a replacement of a whole reactor uh, or of a whole vessel or even a replacement of a whole process itself if that's so you need someone who knows about the process in the hazard review is the change permanent if it is not permanent if it is just a temporary change how long would it change it would you change it back or how long would you actually uh, progress and move it into a permanent change and what other changes need to be made in order to make it a permanent change? So these are the questions that you need to ask during the classifications, classification review. And then you can assemble the right people for the hazard review. And for the hazard, hazard review, it can be in the form of a PHA. But it can also be other form like what if or some kind of other review. And if you know about res alarm rationalization, alarm rationalization is also itself a kind of a hazard review because we look at the consequences, we look at the cause, we look at the um, what kind of actions the operator can take, and we do a qualitative uh, account and analysis on the severity of the consequences against the respond time, maximum respond time for the operator to arrive on the priority level for the alarms. So that is in a way a hazard review itself. And during the hazard review, we have to look at whether there should be changes to the procedures we have to look at whether there might entail new trainings or maybe even increase the training frequencies for the operators. And also we have to look at if there is any other new safety issues during startup and shutdown. Now, let us go back to the example. Let us look, let us look at the change in the alarm system that's related to the deep water horizon. So we know that the change is, first of all, they silenced the alarm across the bridge, drill shack, and also the engineering control room. And they also 
change the general master alarm in a way that it can only be activated manually. So I will ask these questions. Is there an MOC document? Is there a hazard review? Is there an operator training entailed to that? Obviously, there was none. So let us begin to go into the classification review. Is this a change? It is definitely a change in the alarm system configuration. So will the change still meet the design intent of the alarm? The design intent of the alarm is to tell people to evacuate to a safe location. So do they right now have enough time if the operator actually needs to activate it manually after diagnosing the situation? So that is a very, very, um, very crucial question to be asked during the classification review. Is this a replacement? Because there's a configuration change, that means that there will be new procedures details, new stuff for the operator to do. So there will be a replacement in procedure. And I would presume that this is a temporary change, although we all know that somehow it gets into the system, creeps into the system, and becomes something permanent. But if they don't really have a MOC uh, procedure in place, then that's no point to say whether it is temporary or permanent. And right now, let's proceed into the hazard review. We all know the consequence of this alarm. If, they, if the operator does not do anything, then there will be injuries, there might be environmental impact, release into the atmosphere, and they spend days to clean up the oceans as well. And also, it will, it will result in a revamp of the procedure because right now you have new operator actions. And also because it is a general alarm, that means that you affect everyone on site. So does the alarm allow enough time for the operator to take actions and also for everyone to take actions, to scram, to go to a safe place? So that is a very crucial, crucial thing that we need to think about when we think about operator actions. And also, obviously, the operators need new training, how to deal with this alarm. And because the MOC wasn't done properly, and this is the consequence. So basically, the operator was overwhelmed with all the alarms going off. A lot ticking to take in, a lot going on, and her boss was saying that he kept silencing the alarm so that he could think about what actually he could do next. He said that I don't think anyone was trained for the massive detectors that were going off that night. They were not trained in a way that they could handle the alarms properly. So there was lack of training. And the result, we all know that the result was a injuries and also environmental impact. Now let's look at another example, a toxic chemical release at the DuPont site. This is a site at Bell in West Virginia and they were uh, manufacturing pesticides and the chemical involved was the false gene and the result was the false gene was released into the atmosphere and we all know that false gene was actually used as a chemical weapon back in World War I, and it was a very, very toxic chemical. And because of this incident, an operator died, unfortunately. So what exactly happened in this site? They stored the false gene as an in an open area. They call it the false gene shed. And they sh uh, ship in the uh, these force gene tank on uh, lorry trucks, and then they, whenever they need to switch the tank, when the force gene tank runs low, they have to switch it manually. In a way that, uh, whenever the force gene cylinder, the level of force gene runs low, low, there will be alarm that's associated in the control room. 
to tell the operator to go there to manually open and close the valves at the, at the cylinder to purge it with nitrogen glass and swap out the tank. And what happened was they closed the valve of the force gene hose with the there are with force gene within the hose and left it out there with the increase in temperature that result in the burst of these force gene hose. And the force gene was released into the atmosphere. So what actually went wrong specifically related to the alarm system is about their maintenance. The hoses, all the hoses, were not changed over seven months. And the reason for that was that the alarm configurations was changed. It was changed in a way that there was no maintenance alarm anymore to tell the operator that they have to go and change the hose. So I will ask them, was there an MOC document for this change? Was there a hazard review for this change? Did you train your operator how to handle this situation? Well, obviously not. So let's look at the classification review for this change. Is it actually a change? It is definitely a change. You change your alarm system. Does it still meet the design intent of the alarm? The design intent of the alarm is for maintenance. It's to tell the operator, hey, it's time for you to change the holes else there might be a failure of the hose. So once taking this alarm off your alarm system, that definitely defeat your design intent of this alarm, right? So is this also a replacement? Ideally, there should be a replacement of procedure. Maybe you have other means to uh, tackle this problem to tell the operator that you have to swap out the hose in another way. But um, I don't know in details, roughly say they, don't, they didn't do the MOC properly, so they didn't have anything like that in place. So is this also supposed to be a temporary change? Obviously, they didn't perform their MOC well, so this question isn't in a way, is a mute. But when you make changes like that, you have to ask yourself, is it a temporary change? Or you will actually uh, introduce the alarm back in in the future? Or there will be some other means to replace the alarm in a way that it can be a permanent change in the future. Let's look at the hazard right now. So what is the hazard? Um, if the operator does not change the host, the operator's action, the consequence of that operator's inaction would be host failure and the force gene released into the atmosphere. So there will be safety consequences, the fatality, there will be environmental consequences, the toxic release. So as you can see, there's no way that they can actually remove this alarm without any other safeguard in place. So why was it removed? Why was it removed? Obviously, something went wrong with their authorization. They didn't actually authorize, uh, have a proper authorization for this change. So maybe the operator just go into the system, mess with the system, and change the alarm. And they didn't even have any record or any documentation for that. So that no one actually knew that the change was in place, and no one there, there was no kind of authorization procedure for that change in a way that they have to face this consequence. So what happened was an operator was sprayed with the force gene on the chest, on the face. He was sent into the hospital that day, but he died the following day. And there were two other releases, not force gene releases, but other chemical releases within the same week, in the same plant, in a similar way both failure of uh, the host of connections. And there was another release incident that is very similar to what happened in Bell in Buffalo, New York, in another DuPont plant. And a 
worker was injured because of that. So we can see if we do not do the MOC properly, we have ve we can have very serious consequences. So let us right now look at how the standard define how uh, alarm rationalization process should be. During an alarm rationalization process, we have to look whether this alarm is valid or not. We have to look at the consequences. We have to look at the cause, how to confirm this is this a, the true alarm instead of a false alarm, what are the corrective actions, and also you have to document the operator's response time. If there is no corrective action, no action the operator hand can do, then this shouldn't be an alarm. You should probably find other ways to prevent the situation, like a safety trip. But uh, this is not alarm. This is just an alarm that's going to give operator stress, to give operator more burden psychologically. And because we look at the consequence of, in, of the inaction, because we look at the uh, response time, we rank the severity of the consequences, then we can arrive at the alarm priority level for that particular alarm. In that way, that is a kind of a hazard review. And after that, we look at the alarm classifications and the alarm set point and all other attribute of the alarms. So, and also we will look at whether there is some kind of need for special handling of alarms. And we need a team with different people, usually with someone from the process and very, very importantly, someone from the operator side because they are the one that's all going to operate the, the plant. If you put something within, um, for example, the operator action, if you put something in there in a way that they can't understand it, then that's then the that alarm help will be mute. That operator action document will be mute. And also you need a facilitator to know how these rationalization is being conducted to guide the whole team at the right direction. And the result of the rationalization would be the master alarm database. And it is required by the ISA standard that you at least have to have the alarm type, priority, class, set point, operator action, and also the consequence of inaction. And your alarm philosophy should define who and what can be changed and when stuff can be changed within the control system. That is the authorization of the change. For example, uh, I know that some plant would like to authorize only the supervisor to be able to shelve the alarm, to silence the alarm, while operators cannot shelve or silence the alarm on their own. And uh, how we actually implement these kind of changes is, is depends on how we how the changes comes in first. For example, if it is a brown field project in a way that you have done the alarm rationalization, then you have a master alarm database, a result of your rationalization, and then you just need to get these alarm data exported from the alarm master alarm database and then import that back into your control system to overwrite the attribute alarm attribute within your control system if the changes come first into the in the control system then vice versa it'll be the other way when we overwrite the attribute of the alarms we have to look at these changes and there are ways that the seal alarm can help with that because there are different status in seal alarm that you can use. For example, if it's incompleted change, if it's on hold change, if, if this change is under review, if this change is already configured within the control system, if this change is deconfigured from the control system. For example, you take out this alarm during rationalization and the alarm has already been this deconfigured within the control system, then it will mean that it is deconfigured. And these are the import setting that you can use for the seal alarm. Why do we talk about import here? Is because 
the way we Exeter uh, recommend you to do MOC is through this way. First of all, uh, when you start the rationalization project, you export the alarms from the control system, you import these data into your SEO alarm file, and then you start your alarm rationalization. After you, you finish the alarm rationalization, you end up with a master alarm database. So you can import that back into your SEO alarm file before the rationalization. So in that way, you can compare the changes. So that's why you need to do these import setting right there in a way that SEO alarm can actually produce these this ordered viewer for you to highlight each change and to produce the MOC document over there. And for this ordered view, each row means a change in the attribute of each alarm. And you can enforce it, accept it, reject each change. There are different options. And also, you can look at the order status for each of the changes within the SEO alarm. And most importantly, you can export the whole ordered view out into an Excel file. So you can mess with it, do a lot of macro VBA script writing to process the data, and then import it back into the SEO alarm and do, do the MOC properly. And after you accept the import, there will be a separate report being produced, which we call the difference report. It will highlight all the changes that's been done with its original value within your control system compared to the new value after the rationalization. And uh, for the difference report, we highlight different changes to on different tabs, like what kind of changes list, what kind of changes, especially to the additions, deletions, and the priority changes, and also the set point changes. Set point changes is very, very important because the change in set point would greatly affect your process, or even in a sense of a batch plant, it will affect your whole phase of production. So the way to identify unauthorized changes first to, to identify whether there is any kind of change within your control system set point first, your, your alarms in the control system, whether the set point has been changed. If yes, then, that, then you look at and compare the, con, the set point in the control system and the set point in your master alarm database. If they does not match, then that means something went wrong and you have to compare to see a previous version of your control system's alarm attribute. Compare that, whether that is matching with your master alarm database. If it matches, that means that someone actually did some changes within the control system bypassing the rationalization process. So that would be an unauthorized change. So that is how we catch unauthorized changes to the alarm set point through this way. And rationalization is a very long process. Um, there is a plant, uh, actually there are several plants that um, would bring me in multiple times to do rationalizations for different stages. And there is one plant that would bring me in every year just to do one unit. So uh, maybe a week for 1,000 for 500 alarms to 2,000 alarms to look at a process very closely and do a crazy week of rationalization, very tiring. And then we do that again for the next year and do another unit. So as you can see, a rationalization can be broken into very small multiple stages. So that means that you have to do that MOC process again, again, and break that down into multiple stages again. So we all know that this is very, very tedious. Therefore, we actually provide the MOC package service. We can help you to produce the MOC document. And within that, that MOC document, we will highlight these changes. Whether the alarm is enabled within the control system, 
but during rationalization, they were disabled, or vice versa. They were disabled in the control system, but were enabled during the rationalization. And whether there's any changes to the, uh, there are any changes to priority, whether there are any changes to the set points, whether there are any changes to the dead band on delay off delay. The dead band percentage, the on, on delay after off delay, there are ways to prevent chattering alarm and nuisance alarms. I'm sorry, I can't go into them in details today because of limit of time, but I believe there are webinars there. Might be, maybe I can also do a webinar in the future to talk about these uh, handling of alarms in a way that they can help you to reduce these kind of nuisance alarms. So this is an overlook of our MOC Pro uh, package service. And um, you see there are different tabs, the disabled and the enabled tab. And uh, that basically conclude how an MOC can be done within the uh, rest, uh, for your alarm system. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Unfortunately, uh, because of the time limit, um, it's already over an hour, unfortunately. So I actually need to stop very soon. I do receive a lot of questions. I'm sorry, I can't answer all of them. I can't answer any, any of them during, the, uh, during this webinar, but I will be able to answer them uh, afterwards, after the email. I do have a question about uh, whether I can send out the slides. Um, uh, actually, all these webinars would be uploaded onto YouTube and also uploaded onto our website. So you can hear them again and look at the whole, all the slides again and again. So that might be a time lag for that. Usually it takes about a week or two, or two weeks for them to be uploaded. So you can revise them and review them afterwards. And uh, we also have a lot of causes, interesting causes, uh, that's organized by our Exeter Academy, if you're interested, especially if you're interested in alarms, then uh, you can go to the Fundamentals of Alarm Management for Practitioner. Uh, this course will actually help, uh, will actually uh, award you with a practitioner certification in a way that is a certificate to show that you are capable of doing alarm management in a way that uh, you can be the alarm champion within your plant. I, if you have any question, please uh, send an email to me. That is my email right there, paulchen at exeter.com. And thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I'm really happy uh, to see all of you guys and very grateful that you come to the webinar hope i'm waiting for your questions and hopefully i will be able to see you guys again next time when i do another webinar thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day thank you bye bye